All right, this is an exciting one for me. I've been waiting so long to do this project, really since shingling my roof. All I could think about was how much rainwater it could collect and putting in a rain collection system. This is a 30,000 gallon tank for my new rainwater collection system. It's sometimes also referred to as rain harvesting. And basically what it is, is whenever you collect the rain and put it in a storage container for later use. You can use the rain coming off the roof as is for all non-potable uses. So doing laundry, flushing toilets, irrigation, pretty much everything outside of drinking it. However, you can very easily make the water potable so that it can be drinkable and then run your entire household off of it. I found the concept as well as the process so fascinating. So let me walk you through my personal installation. And then at the end, I'll talk about different reasons why people invest into a rain collection system. Real quick, I wanna say a big thank you to Lowe's for sponsoring this video. On a system this size, you can't buy a tank at your local Lowe's, but you can buy all of the plumbing, connections, and the guttering system. If you go with the tank my size, you will need to have it professionally installed. And I went with the leading experts in my area called Harvested Rain Solutions. Regardless of how big or small the system is, the main components are the same. You need a way to collect rain off of a surface. This is typically a rooftop and gutters. Then you need a container to put the rain in. This can be a small barrel or something much larger like a tank. Then you also need plumbing to connect the two. This can be something as simple as placing a downspout directly into a barrel or something more complex like trenching and running pipe underground. When I built the shop, I didn't install gutters. So the first step in my process was to get gutters installed and have a way to collect the water. You can certainly do gutter installation yourself by buying the pieces and joining them together. But one huge advantage to going through a professional is they have the equipment to show up on site and custom make a seamless gutter for the length of your building. I always dread looking for contractors to do jobs at my place. Fetting them is just so time consuming. So I went ahead and took advantage of Lowe's installation services. Lowe's has a service to match homeowners to independent contractors in their areas for different jobs, such as window install, deck building, fence installation, and so many more categories. So I used the service to find a company to install my gutters. Having seamless gutters meant the team custom made two lengths of gutters about 74 feet long. And it was insanely cool to watch coming out of this tiny box truck. After the form was made, a few brackets were placed inside to not only give it bones to hold its shape, but also give a way to connect it to the building. It took three guys coordinating to lift it up into place, center it on the building, and then start securing it. And this whole process took less than two hours as I told them to leave off the downspouts. Those are gonna be added on later. Now that I had a way to collect the rain, now it was time to work on the other two components, setting a tank and running the plumbing. The team from Harvested Rain Solutions showed up with a trailer full of needed equipment and got started right away. First was to prepare the site where the tank would be built. And tank placement is pretty important. I was thinking about placing it on the south end of my shop where it would be really close to the collection point. But I ended up moving it more into the woods on the east side, which meant more trenching for plumbing, but it placed the tank below the level of my shop, which will allow gravity to assist in the water moving into the tank from the gutters. I'll be mostly using the water for irrigation needs, not only around my shop, but also around my house. So while 30,000 gallon tank is large, it will get used surprisingly quickly in my hot climate. The tank needs a pad made from sand. So Ron started flattening, then building up a level location with dirt first, then with sand. There's not really a bottom necessarily. The tank is built directly on the sand pad and then a liner later goes inside. So it's important to get this really level. The site started off with about a five inch difference from one side to the next. And after using the machine and an experienced eye to roughly get it level, the next step to fine tune it was to go around with a stick that has a laser on it. It's actually called a transit. <laughs> and find the high points and the low points. I've never used a transit before, but it was a very handy tool. I could set my laser stick in different places around the pad and it would tell me if that area was high or low. Then also by how much. Then Ron would either move material in or take it away depending on the answer. After going as far as he could with the machine, we repeated the same process, but now used rakes. And that's the pad done. The next step will be to build the tank on it. But while we were doing that, the other guys were trenching for the plumbing. Now my area is mostly rock, but I've done a lot of dirt work to grade up to my building. And these lines are only placed about 12 inches deep. Nope, we don't have a frost line. The guys did encounter some rock, but it was mostly dirt and they made great progress. A line needed to be trenched the entire length of the shop on both the front and the back side. 
Then another line to connect the two. This is so that when the gutters collect the rain, it'll travel down the downspouts, then into the plumbing into the ground. The water from the back will join water from the front, then go into a single line that will be trenched over to the tank. The machine did most of the heavy lifting here, then the guys went back with shovels to trench out a path for the downspouts to connect to the main lines. On the length of my building, I'll have three downspouts, one on either end and then somewhere close to the middle. Once the trenches were dug, they started laying the plumbing. Long sections of high pressure rated PVC were connected together, starting at one end of the shop and then going to the other. Every joint is primed and also glued together. The main pipe was cut at each one of the downspouts in order to add in a fitting to also tie them in. You can see these downspouts were placed carefully so that they ended up at the center of my post. And it's small details like this that made me very happy I went with experienced installers. Since there were three people on the crew, joining these together went very quickly. Keep in mind that all the work shown so far was done in a single day. But Ron here has done jobs by himself and developed a cool trick I wanted to show off for making a connection alone. After priming and gluing, he used a strap hooked onto one end to pull on the joint of pipe while guiding it in. I love tricks like that. So the size of PVC being ran is determined by a few factors, which I found interesting. My line starts off using three inch PVC and then goes up to four inch and then goes up to six inch because as water moves through the pipe, the friction between those two surfaces causes a slight pressure to build up. It's actually called head loss. And so to compensate or overcome that pressure, you can increase the diameter of the pipe, giving the water more area to travel in. Elbow room. <laughs> oh, and here's another good trick for joining PVC. It was tricky getting the 45 seated on the straight by just shoving it at two opposite ends. So the guys dropped it into the ground, used a shovel against the bank and on the edge to compress it together. You gotta love leverage. The rest of the PVC was placed in the trench all the way to the tank. Then they came to do the backfilling. Since I have a ton of rock in my dirt, they used some clean fill I had on hand to put down directly on the pipe first. Then he could very quickly use a skid steer to knock the rust over and grade it back like it was before. With that tripping hazard covered back up, the guys installed the downspouts. If you already have metal downspouts and you could swap them out for PVC ones that could then tie into the main lines. These are made from PVC but are painted to match the color of my fascia and my gutters. Another thing you can get started with if you're interested in collecting rainwater but don't want to invest in a large system yet is to purchase a cute barrel like this one that you can find at Lowe's and place it directly under your downspout so that rainwater from your gutters will fall directly into it. That's it for most of the trenching, so let's go ahead and go on to the exciting part, the giant tank. This bundle here on the trailer is not only my 30,000 gallon tank, but also all of the fittings, pump, liner, and hardware to complete it. <laughs> I think that's nuts. And let me tell you, it did not take long to assemble it. This is a Pioneer metal tank that will get a plastic liner inside of it. Note, there are a few choices on tank materials out there. You can get plastic, metal, or even concrete. Pioneer has been making and improving tanks for this purpose for over 30 years. So they know what works and they know what doesn't. They know how to make it easy to assemble, but also reliable to use. The guy started building up the tank by joining the bottom panels together with vertical bolt strips. After the bottom layer was complete, the same process was repeated on the top. To kind of give you scale, the diameter of this tank is 26 feet and it's seven feet tall. No, it is not a swimming pool, but it is large enough to be. <laughs> with the body done, it was time to start building out the roof. Two trusses span the distance from one side to the other. Then the inside requires some prep work before the metal roofing panels can go down. First, plastic liner strips are placed over all of the vertical bolt strips. This serves two purposes. One, to protect the liner from the hardware holding together the tank, and two, to keep the condensation on the inside of the tank instead of moving to the outside. A condensation strip is also added along the entire top rim for the same purpose. Okay, and now the roofing panels, which are first secured to the two trusses. And I'm sure I'm gonna get asked, but yes, Pioneer actually does make a tank that collects water from its own roof. At this point, the roofing material is only secured to the trusses. And to locate the outer rim of the tank, the guys use this pretty clever jig made up from small PVC pipe. There are two joints that are the same length so that the bottom joint can be placed on the tank's lip, which gives the location on the top to the person running the drill. Tell me that's not a good one. Once they secured all the way around the tank, next they used a pair of shear cutters to trim all of the pieces from square to round. 
Oh, also a hatch was added in with a ladder that drops down. And heck, yes, I got inside too. When am I ever gonna be able to get inside my own tank again? It was surprisingly light inside and really cool in my opinion. This would be a cool little kid's fort, adult kid fort. The first thing to do inside was to lay down a geotech material, which will prevent things from being able to grow up inside. Then the liner was unpackaged, unrolled, and installed. Oh, and at this point, it was a no-shoe zone. The liner is plastic, but it's BPA-free and NSF-61 certified with embedded sanitized antimicrobial technology. Embedded sanitized antimicrobial. Antimicrobial. Am I saying that right? Antibacteria. And it's worth noting that this aqua liner is exclusive to Pioneer tanks. It's first attached to the bottom with the built-in tabs, then all along the top. Now with my roof size, which is around 3,700 square feet, or 344 square meters for you metric watchers, it'll take about 12 inches of rain to fill this tank. Once it's full, the excess will go out what is known the overflow line, which you can see being cut here. This is located on the back of my tank so that when it's used, the water will go out into the woods, which is also the lower point of the area. Now, to get the water out of the tank and then back uphill, a small submergible pump is added to the inside of the tank and plumbed in. So, looking at this shot here, the 6-inch line brings all of the water in. The conduit line is powered to run the pump and also gives me an outlet on the tank to utilize. Then this is the return line where the pump will push it back uphill to where I need it. A shutoff valve is there as well as a hose bib. Then just one more line that clearly isn't seen from that shot is a low point drain, which goes into a valve that will allow me to flush the pipes out should I want to clean out any sediment from the lines or if I don't get rain for a while, then the water in the lines will be stagnant and need to be flushed out so that it doesn't enter into the tank. Okay, and just two more things, and then I think that wraps up the system. To prevent corrosion to the tank, two magnesium-filled anode bags are buried around the tank. You'll see the same concept used in water heaters or even buried propane tanks. Then, to prevent erosion of the sand, a layer of gravel is added to the base and spread around. It's worth noting that you can get tanks in different colors, but I absolutely love the look and color of my tank. Overall, it took four days to get the system complete, which I find incredible considering how much trenching my layout required and how rocky my terrain is. I am sure a lot of people will ask why. Why consider a rain harvesting system? For one thing, I love utilizing a resource that's available. So the idea of collecting rain coming off an existing roof and then using it for my irrigation or other gray water needs is just really appealing to me. But then you can also consider the amount of control having your own water source gives you. I have a well, but that could dry up. Or another common problem in this area is the water is too hard, even with the water softener. Also, if I turn my water into potable water, then I'm gonna have complete control over its quality. Even if you follow all the rules to protect groundwater, all it takes is one neighbor not following the rules to contaminate everybody's well in the area. Then for people who rely on city water, they are reliant on the city's department to do correct and also enough quality testing. And you're also constrained to their standards. If you have your own water source, then you're in 100% control of the standard and the amount of checks. Okay, so keep in mind that while my state doesn't outlaw rainwater collection, a lot of states and countries do. So be sure to check your local laws before investing in one. Remember that you can start small with a barrel under a downspout to water a garden or some grass. But if you're going to get a larger system like this one, then I 100% recommend finding a knowledgeable resource to plan the system out for you. I have gained so much knowledge from Harvested Rain Solutions because they've been doing it for so long. They definitely get a big thumbs up from me. So if you're in the Texas area and would like to give them a shout, then I do have their information down for you below. I would love to hear your thoughts down below. Do you have a rainwater collection system? And if you do, what made you start collecting? And do you have anything that you would advise people looking to get a system? Oh, also, I've left you links to two friends of mine who have videos out on their rain collection system. So check down below if you're interested in diving a little bit deeper into the rain harvesting world. I hope that you have found this video helpful, and I will see you soon.